Hello, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to this fabulous Zoom. Use the chat and tell us where you're tuning in from, please. Because that's one of the most fun parts of doing this. We host a lot of shop or a lot of events in the shop, but doing it this way also allows us to welcome more of you that can't get here from Seattle or to Seattle, excuse me. Let me make sure I have this turned on. Yes, I do. I'm in Seattle. Where are you? We'll let a few more people get logged in before we start. Mill Creek. Hello, Lisa. Anyone else? San Francisco. Hello, San Jose. Welcome. San Diego, West Coast representing on your lunch break. <laughs> Thank you. New York. Sorry, my camera's doing the zoomy thing. I, I will hold still so it'll stop. Excellent. I'm going to check this number here. All right. I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm Laura Hamilton. I have a bookshop here in Seattle, Washington called Book Larder. We, like I said a little earlier, if you were on here, do a lot of in-shop author talks and um, cooking classes and things like that. And in the pandemic, we started to take those events to Zoom. And for very special um, authors and conversations like this one, we decided that it was good to keep the Zoom events going because it allows us to have chats like this one that we can't necessarily have in Seattle and also allows a lot of you um, to tune in from all over the place. So thank you for being here. The talk is being recorded today and so it will be available on our YouTube channel within the next 24, 48 hours. Um, so if you have to pop off early or you want to share this talk with friends, um, you are very welcome to do that. Uh, we are also have the closed captioning enabled and so if you want to turn that on you can do that from the bottom of your screen at um, in the closed caption section. And then one more housekeeping thing, um, we will leave plenty of time for questions today, but if you have those if you could please use the Q and a button at the bottom of your screen in order to ask the questions and use the chat to talk to each other and that will just allow us to keep the questions a little more organized. All right, so today we are welcoming Nikki Segnet. She is the author of this fabulous Flavor Thesaurus More Flavors. Um, Nikki is one of those authors who has the unbelievable to me ability to um, be extremely creative in terms of like her capacity for playing with flavors and trying out ideas, but then also has the ability to organize it all so the rest of us can appreciate all of her work and ideas. Um, a rare combination that makes her books ones that, you know, are sort of stand the test of time. I know I refer to the first flavor thesaurus all the time and have been very excited to use this one as well. She is going to be in conversation with Cynthia Shanmugalingam who is a London-based restaurateur and the author of Rambutan, as you can see, a very used cookbook in, a very heavily used cookbook in my kitchen and one of my favorites of 20, 2022, and now award-winning as well. They are going to talk about the book. They are, as I said, leave time for questions. So um, you can just leave those in the chat or excuse me, in the Q&A. Um, we also, of course, have book plate signed copies of the book in the store. And so I will put a link to that in the chat so you can um, support the chat, or excuse me, support the talk by um, purchasing a copy from Book Larder if that is works for you. And thank you to those of you who have done so already. I really appreciate that. All right, so now I'm gonna turn things over to Nikki Senget and Cynthia Shanmugalingam. Thank you so much, Laura. Um, hello. Hi, everyone. Hi. Hi, hi. So I just wanted to start by saying thank you for writing this extraordinary, another extraordinary gift of a book. Um, and I feel like the first flavor of Sephoris, it's 
it's got the qualities of an instant classic. It's a, um, a mix of recipes and food science and historical notes and it's written in a very witty and engaging way. Um, and it has a very diverse kind of global perspective. It takes into account recipes from China and from the Middle East and India, Sri Lanka even. Um, and it feels like there's so much depth in how you think about flavor. You consider um, minerality and the petrochemicality of something, and whether it's floral or nutty or milky or has caramel-like qualities. And um, I feel like it's such a gift for a cook because you get, um, I feel like a flavor that you might know um, unravels itself as you get into the book, which is um, a really exciting thing to engage with. So thank you for writing it all in the realm of plants and in the realm, like, there is some, there are, like, it's not a vegan cookbook, there's some cheese and, and eggs and, 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 and other dairy in it, but it's, uh, it's very forward on plants and on, and on spices, on legumes, on fruits. It's an, and it, it's an extraordinary compendium of, of flavor pairings. So, so I, and I sort of wanted to start with, with one of the flavor pairings that's most familiar to me, which is cashew and chili. And when you mm -hmm. talk about um, that combination, you talk about hot devil cashews, which is a favorite Sri Lankan bar snack, um, where and cashews, you know, can be eaten in all kinds of different ways. They come with lashings of chili in, in Sri Lanka. And it got me thinking about how did you happen upon, what was your process in writing the book? How did you happen upon the fact that cashews go well with such diverse ingredients like fenugreek and oat or zucchini or vanilla? How, 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 did, you, well, how did you even kind of get to that? Uh, firstly, hi, Cynthia. Hi. Thank you very much for taking time out of your very busy book writing and restaurant running to talk to me. Um, and I apologize for wearing these very small headphones that belong to my child because <laughs> my, my sound cut out. But um, how I go about it, uh, it's the same for both books. So both the Flavoured Thesaurus and the new one, the Flavoured Thesaurus More Flavours, so the sequel. Um, what I do is I start, it's really basic. I start with a list of ingredients. So the first book was started with 160 ingredients, which became by the time things got folded together because they could kind of be considered fairly similar in what they had to offer as far as flavor was concerned. Um, so it became 99. The new book is 92 different flavors. I write a list and then I gather together a list of classic pairings and then things that come through the research as I go. So the first book took three years to write, the second one has taken four years to write. As I'm working round in circles, researching those ingredients one by one, going into great depth about them, um, then those lists kind of get refined as I go. And I, I mean, I just read a lot of material, but I probably read a lot of material that most people who read food books don't read. So I read, obviously I read, you know, the kind of cookbooks and say the food books that most people who are into kind of cookery do read, but I go back to, you know, quite a lot of historical texts. I read agricultural texts. I read flavor science um, papers, that kind of thing. So I kind of go into quite a lot of great detail and depth about things. And what happens is you, that those themes present themselves and present themselves and present themselves. So for example, something like the, you know, when you're looking at cashew, obviously the countries where cashews grow, you're gonna find that there's a lot of flavor pairings that are particularly special to that country, but then you'll find what the, the non-native countries, how they might use those ingredients and then what the cultural kind of connections, uh, the more modern cultural connections of those ingredients are. and that provides a lot of answers, that provides a lot of material. But particularly for the new book, I find myself trying to divorce myself a bit from those cultural connections and just concentrate on the flavor itself and try and just 
appreciate the ingredients for what they are, which of course is, um, you know, you'll probably, you can't be very purist about it, but it's quite, it was definitely something that I did with this that I didn't do so much with the first book. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and is that, and I feel like, is that how this, this is, this sort of, um, I don't know how to flavor wheel you flavor wheel this wheel yeah. of flavors where you 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 group together flavors that kind of work I guess have similarities or core similarity essence of similarities in some way some which seem very intuitive like prunes and raisins and tamarind are in the kind of dried fruit category mm. but others like avocado pistachio chili one might not put, put those together how how did you get to those kind of families of, of flavors and, and and what significance do they play for you in, in in the book so the first both the first book and the second book the, they are primarily they are the organizing principle of the book so uh when people say to me is it like the color wheel uh now the color wheel obviously has very you know deeply practical application uh for all people that work in design uh, whereas, the, you know, I wish that I had designed something for flavor that was that kind of sound and that practical and useful, I would be, I'm sure, a, a millionaire. But no, the flavor wheels are, they are, you know, they're the organizing principles for both of the books. Now, um, the book, the the idea for the flavor thesaurus comes from Roger's thesaurus. So um, when when the name came into my head, it was it was because I'm a great I'm a great reader. Um, I like you know I when I like all school children when I was writing I used my Roger's thesaurus of synonyms to try and help me refine my writing, improve my writing to a certain degree, improve my thinking, so that it, you know. Um, the thing about Roger uh, that maybe some people don't know is that it's organized in philosophical themes. And so, when, you know, when you look up a word, what's in the adjacent category and the adjacent entry might take you somewhere where you think, oh, that's actually that's that's expressing more what I meant or actually that's a more interesting idea than I had originally. And that's what I would like to now take my thinking in that direction. So all the time that I was writing the flavor thesaurus, I hadn't quite got this even though that I was aware from flavor um, textbooks of flavor wheels I'd seen them uh, at the very outset of what I was uh, of the of the project and I love them I love it you know I love something like that I find it really fascinating but I hadn't put the two and two together until really towards the end of writing the first book and I was thinking how am I going to organize this I don't want to make it an A to Z it's too boring it's too prosaic to do that I want it to be I want it to be more um stimulating mm -hmm. after all that is kind of the purpose of the book and uh and then it kind of it occurred to me to put the two together because not only could one make a flavor wheel of all the different flavors but actually if you read both the books you'd understand I mean you have to be you know a bit of a I mean, and there are people, believe me, that kind of really do kind of study them and know the text very well. But if you read, if you did, if you're very dedicated and you read the text, you'll find out why they're plotted in where they are on the wheel. And they kind of, they're both spectrums of flavor. So in a molecular level, usually one runs into the one next to it and next to it and next to it. So, you know, it's a kind of, it's a spectrum of flavor. And then I divide them into flavor families, partly because it's just, it's nice. It's, you know, it's a lovely idea. And if we're thinking about something, think about whether something is, um, you know, spicy, woody, or, you know, I mean, that some of them are bramble and hedge in the first book, flower and meadow. It's just, it takes, you know, flavor is, it should be, it's a romantic subject. Mm. Um, so it's really about kind of loving, loving the subject, loving the descriptors, making it interesting, making it useful for, you know, it's it's mainly used by creative people. And so that's, I think, certainly for myself and the books that I use to influence me, that's the kind of thing that I like. They Told are. you I did long answers. No, great. <laughs> they are extraordinarily evocative, I think, um, as titles and as ideas. 
And I wondered if you had any any favorites that you wanted to, to, to talk about that, you know, that you that you really felt um, that you felt excited about or felt were particularly resonant. It's difficult, isn't it? Because there's, I think there's probably 800 in the new mm -hmm. book. There's, I mean, I used to know how much, I mean, 942 in the first book, Pairings. So it's a lot. And um, and I get asked a lot about kind of the weird ones, mm. you know, the outliers, things like, so for this book, I think a lot of people want to talk about chocolate and aubergine, mm -hmm. chocolate and eggplant, sorry, that kind of, you know, things that sound unlikely actually when you taste it it's really not as unlikely as you think because the fruitiness of the you know like fry an aubergine in slices and we're quite used to having that with honey or you know different kind of date syrups and that kind of thing so chocolate is not that much of a leap but it just sounds kind of very unusual if I put my glasses on I do have a list of some of the um mm. so things that I came across uh, just something that I'd never had before black pepper and allspice in a pepper grinder together and what the, the you know the all you have to get a particular grinder that's big enough to take the allspice berries but what a beautiful combination that is and if you you know over a mac and cheese or cauliflower and cheese and stuff what the allspice lends to the pepper to make this kind of very tastes you know maybe you know it tastes like a really interesting black pepper berry it's not completely, it, it, there's a big crossover in the flavor, but it's just, it's got a, a kind of lift of extra freshness. I mean, I didn't really know allspice particularly before I wrote the book. And then I got to know it quite well writing, you know, going, as I say, writing it in cycles and going back to it a few times and thinking it tastes to me like fresh ironing. Mm -hmm. And uh, my husband thought that was very funny because he said, <laughs> he said, I didn't perhaps know what fresh ironing tasted <laughs> like. <laughs> as much as perhaps I thought I did. And uh, there's some truth <laughs> to that. Uh, but it's certainly what I've smelt with other people of ironing. Um, something, uh, there's, I put it on my Instagram because there's a recipe that goes with it. Uh, for a, a maple syrup tart with fennel. Mm. And something like maple syrup is a really interesting ingredient because you have this wonderful natural product, very expensive, really expensive here at least, isn't it? And so you can use it with lots of things, but if you really want to kind of preserve its flavor, I'm interested in how do you pair something like this without undermining its beauty? Mm. And because fennel is quite a natural note in, particularly in the darker, but in the amber, but also in the dark one, just a very small amount of fennel really kind of picks it up in the same way that lemon might with something like a, a more, you know, our bog standard golden syrup, which has a lemon, like a citric, twist to it it works in the same way so I I got very into that made a very nice tart there's a re as I say there's a recipe on my Instagram for that um I was going to say gooseberry and bay but in the states you can't really get gooseberry so I'm not sure how useful that is uh aren't you that's a shame not really I think it's because um when I was working on the first book I was really amazed to find that in the states you don't really get black currants I'm amazed at that too yeah it's they were they were outlawed by federal law wow. because because they are bad like no you can have a gun but you can't have a black gun. <laughs> um there's there's a there's an aphid that there's a little beastie that um, likes black currants that also likes the main um building wood used in the states mm -hmm. so they couldn't have the black currants and do the building of the houses mm -hmm. so they they let the black currants go mm -hmm. and it's probably because gooseberries are part of the same very close member of the same family perhaps mm -hmm. you can't have them but that's why where we have black currant sweets in our red green yellow orange black sweets mm -hmm. are a black currant and in the states they're usually grape aren't they yeah they are that's right uh, I love all that kind of stuff. Flavor trivia. Me too. Me too. It's fascinating. And it's also um, it's fascinating where the country can grow the, the thing that they choose not to for for uh, for another reason. I feel like that it brings me onto like a piece of the book where you talk about this distinction between flavor and taste. Mm -hmm. Remember, it's in the introduction you talk about. Uh, the difference between what you can taste in your tongue and what your nose gives you. And I wondered if you could kind of explain that. Yeah, so I think we get very confused. It's not just um, in English. In lots of languages, the word taste is used 
to kind of cover taste and flavor or we use it interchangeably with the with the idea of flavor but um, if you read sort of technical flavor science books they make the distinction more clearly which is taste is um, something that you experience on your taste buds so uh, the thing that we learned about in biology in uh, at school that you have taste buds that kind of receive sour salt bitter mm. sweet mm. and umami and they're kind of they're quite sort of they're very very important but they're quite basic in the information that they give us about a food whereas flavor which is you know the kind of thing that we're talking about in the flavor wheel spicy woody fruity herb or those kind of like the, the sort of descriptors I say that you see on the back of a wine bottle we experience that through the olfactory bulb in our nose and we tend to obviously when we eat something they both come together and we can kind of we can enjoy the incredibly important balance of taste but also at the same time the perfume the kind of if you like the art it, it, what the art of the of the cook is doing is not just balancing the taste but kind of making sure that the the perfumes are beautifully blended and optimum and but you don't often think about how those two things are kind of working in heart in you know in in harmony together apart from when you have a cold so when you have a cold you can you know you take that lem sip and you can tell that it's very bitter that it's been kind of got loads and loads of artificial sweetener in it to try and balance out that sweetness but when your cold is at its worst and your olfactory bulb is very very um uh swollen from sniffing and blowing your nose you can't necessarily taste whether that is lemon or blackcurrant flavored because right. you're just so that's you know that's when we kind of do notice the difference and you actually really notice um you know you feel very short changed and obviously covid has left a lot of people with with you know with reduced uh, ability to detect flavor and it's 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 very serious people get very very um you know very depressed and it, it has effects all sorts of very important effects on one's life i had um i only lost it temporarily but i lost my sense of smell for two weeks when i had covid and i, I don't know if this is an old wives tale but i was smelling cloves like a jar mm -hmm. of cloves to try and bring it back i read somewhere that it could it could jog jog my nose back into back into action but it, yeah it, it completely dulls uh, your sense of the, of the world I feel like it delves your senses in the different like the sensation of smoke for example is mm -hmm. completely different if you can't smell it it's uh what you think is smoke getting in your eyes or whatever isn't necessarily you know smell such, such a smell and, and and flavor is such a huge piece of that when you when you think when when I think about like words we use in a restaurant to describe flavor like um some, whether something's juicy or if it's got a creamy texture te texture i guess is part of it and um whether yeah whether it's smoky are they are they is that flavor are we using that is that correct well i suppose with the, if something is juicy and creamy that we're probably it's partly texture isn't it so mm -hmm. um that's you know in a way that would be again separate but it's very important you know it's not really possible to divorce say clotted cream from its texture yeah. and yeah and everything about it but um yeah no i think if you were try if you were trying if you're spending a long time thinking about uh, sensory descriptions of food you might pull them apart like i do but i mean i think uh as a rule we're probably not that great at keeping you know it, it, i mean mainly people don't really talk about flavor very much mm -hmm. people talk about taste and then when it gets so when i first started writing the flavor thesaurus one um i really thought that i was going to be going through lots of books like your book and finding the things that that talk about flavor combinations and putting them in my book you know, it would be a collection of lots of, but really people don't tend to write about flavor or certainly I, I felt back in 2008, 2009, when I was searching that book, I came across very few flavor descriptions and certainly almost nothing about kind of how things combine or the reason that I wrote the book in the first place. Why, why, why is this good together? What's going on here? Help me understand why something is nice so I can go and look for other things that are really nice in the same way. And yeah, it's just not something that people tend, I mean, because it takes, you know, it takes a lot of um, 
concentration and it's quite difficult. And I think in Britain, people get a bit worried about it being pretentious. Mm -hmm. you know because it's connected a bit with how people describe wine and then we all get we get a little bit nervous about mm -hmm. seeming um hoity-toity mm -hmm. yeah I, it's particularly interesting when you when i think about like sp kind of spices from my, my perspective I feel like spices were a real root connection um, for me growing up in the UK to, to Sri Lankan cuisine and now in the restaurant I'm trying we're trying to I guess teach people about the spices what does fenugreek do when you add <laughs> it to something and so, sometimes when, you, when it's in a spice mix um, or a spice powder that we that everybody makes and there are a few in Sri Lanka that that kind of occur I think you don't isolate necessarily one and think oh what is the, what dimension is that adding and why is it in a dish you just do it because people tell you to and that's something I've really been enjoying reading about in the book like this sort of you talk about mustard having a sweetness and a nuttiness as well as the more pungent um flavor which is something that is familiar in in my mind and how I think about the, the spice or I think you say that nigella seeds taste like motif have a motif kind of quality um, or there's there's a kind of piney herbal flavor to peppercorns, especially when you're young. And spices play quite an important role, I think, in this book. Would you would you would you say that? And are there are there particular spices or spice pairings that that you could talk about that um, that might be surprising to people? Um, I think a they I mean they 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 play quite a big role in both books. One of the things that's really nice, of course, is they are great, um, great sources of interest and they do have some good writing about them. They're, so there are plenty of ingredients that are really very, very short of interesting stuff to research. And the great thing about spices is that they, you get lots of spice uh, traders and spice shops who keep nice little websites and you get some um you know there are writers i have a book by a guy an american guy called tony hill which i particularly like i have a book by a guy called gary allen um they are both very good at going deep and saying interesting things about the flavor there's a really good website called i think it's gertzner's it's in my in my very extensive bibliography gertzner's spice pages which i think is german and they you know some people go right into the depth there's quite a lot of um uh molecular research into spices because obviously it's not just for fragrance that they use they have preservative properties that you know lots of health properties and stuff so there's 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 material and that's great it's always quite exciting when there's actually some stuff to draw on um i mean i think it, what you're saying actually what you say is quite interesting is how um there are certain spices that one rarely meets outside of like a big cluster and so to take to, to sort of to take things apart and this is what I'm saying about kind of trying to extract something from its cultural background and try and understand it on its own even though you would you know like cloves for example there's not very many times that you meet cloves outside I mean all spice too you know these are quite they're quite hard they're quite um uh, they're quite singular. I mean, clove in particular is sort of 85% one type of molecule. So it's got a very singular uh, character to it. Um, so it's quite, it's interesting to go through that process. Uh, and I suppose that, that is the beauty of writing a book like that is that you have, you know, you have the time and the, the in, energy to invest in kind of looking into that. The one thing I really felt, and there were a couple of things that I didn't know very well before. I didn't know caraway, mm -hmm. and it was the first thing that I started on because I was actually in the States when I started the book, and that was the first thing I started to write about because I wanted to jump into something that I really didn't know. Um, and, you know, it's so unused in the UK. So my experience of it is so American in, like, maybe living in Minneapolis for a while and drinking kumul and eating kind of deli bread in New York and that kind of thing. And the other is, you know, God, fenugreek, which just, you know, I just didn't know. And I came away so thrilled by it and feeling like, you know, like, uh, like I suppose meeting tarragon for the first time 
and thinking this is really special and I don't know why I've not really kind of I think fenugreek got a really rough deal in this country because it was used a lot in kind of supermarkets curry powders or like and and cake mass catering curry powders and and it kind of went out fell out of fashion and I think that's a real shame because actually I think it's really wonderful and you really kind of start to love the ground spice of it but then um getting used to it as getting to know it as a herb Mm-hmm. And the bitterness and the kind of and the and the sort of beautiful aniseed side of it, but also its very own really, I think quite upmarket, quite um, you know, I can almost see it in, you know, when you have it in a a creamy sauce. Yeah, I feel like it's kind of it's got a tarragon-esque kind of quality to it. It feels like fine dining to me. It's really beautiful and complicated and the kind of thing that anybody who really kind of loves food would probably enjoy being introduced to properly you know mm-hmm. by somebody who really knows what to do with it because mm-hmm. it was it felt exciting Huge. in the way that bitter things do yeah hugely it's, it's as bitter I think of it as having a sort of bitter caramel like quality there's a Sri Lankan fish curry very mild fish curry you make with basically boiling fenugreek and red coconut milk and curry leaves and, and onions and it has a yeah it has a kind of creamy uh consistency and almost this ca- yeah caramel it's a bit, bit, bit bitter caramel like mm. um de- delicate flavor that it that it imparts it so yeah it's 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 interesting. Do you feel like it's something that can be taught? I feel like part of what the book is about is about teaching and unpacking kind of new, a new um, level of insight on, on flavour for, for cooks who read it. But I feel like there are some people who maybe they feel that they can't, or do you think that there's a kind of um, taste blindness or, or like like not being able to hear hear music that well or sing sing in tune um well i'm sure so you know maybe 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 some people can't but you can but however bad you are you can definitely improve i think the you know there is the practice you know the practice principle would apply to it completely so you know i started off doing a wine course that's what kind of started me off that's where I learned to use my tasting apparatus that's where I learned to start putting what I was tasting into words that's it and start to be a bit more confident and to start exercising the muscle between what you're experiencing and what your brain is registering and what comes out of your mouth so that you because it and it does I mean it really does take practice and there's nothing really quite like sitting down with um you know eight different types of mustard and trying them all next to each other because in that way I mean that's what I the wine course starts me off with I have six Chardonnays in front of me and they've been made in different ways in different countries with different processes but all from the same grape and that's where you start to notice the difference between something and get um, I suppose get start getting in that practice of tasting things and I think that you, you can't necessarily eat and taste at the same time I think you know if I if I come to your restaurant and I order stuff I'm you know I'm going to enjoy the meal I'm going to be talking to people I'm talking to stuff it's not necessary it's not necessarily going to be the same as the process where you think okay I'm going to teach myself about a little bit about different coconut flavors I'm going to taste some coconut creams and coconut milks and coconut sweets some dry coconut I'm going to sit here and try all these different coconuts so that I have a, a a wider appreciation of this ingredient and I think that's what what my book does is kind of help cut out some of that work for people so that you can just open the book and read about lots of different shades of flavor you can read different ways of expressing it um uh you can read some very outlandish ways of expressing it you can read about it so it it does quite a lot of that work for you so yes i think you know if you if you wanted to you could pick out an ingredient and say oh this week fava beans broad beans are in um are in season I'm going to learn all about them I'm going to read this and you, I mean undoubtedly you get better at it and yes there probably are some people who are a bit 
tone deaf, but um, I don't know if I've ever, you know, apart from somebody who really does have like problems with their olfactory bulb, I don't know, everyone can get better at it. And it's probably, you know, it's a free piece of kitchen equipment that, you know, that most of us can improve on. And it's, you know, it's, it's fun. It's kind of, it's a bit of a game. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, it's so, I, I know that you, I know you're saying that you, um, that you don't, you, you have, you have consciously abstracted from the cultural um, context of some of, of some of these flavors and thought really about what the essence of it is and, 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 and so on. But I, I had been really struck reading it about pairings. And it might be, as you say, that they come from maybe where they're grown. That's why they recur in different, in different mm -hmm. cults. But you know, there's, let's say rice, it's rice and lentils, I think, it's, which is in Kitchidi, it's in a bunch of um, Sri Lankan dishes, it's in Majadra, in, in the Middle East, or, um, mm -hmm. yeah, or like, I think sesame and honey, it's a really well-loved um, combination in, in, in Sri Lanka, I'm, sh I'm sure it is in, in the Middle East too, it, uh, in, in China, there are like, yeah, there are some things I feel like the people have discovered that go that go well together and is that an exciting thing when you happen upon it do you feel like there's something in the essence of the ingredients that kind of look to each other um I mean as for reaching beyond culture I mean that is just, that's a if you like that is a reach I mean you can't right. you can't possibly because of flavor is so culturally embedded you can't really ever go completely beyond it I'm just I'm just trying to strip that out of my head a bit, but it would be unfair to say that one gets tr ever truly beyond that. And, and nor would you want to kind of the cult, all the cultural backgrounds of the ingredients are really important and, um, and part of what makes them interesting. Um, uh, I, I think you just come across things that uh, you know, there are things that perhaps you've read about many, many times, if you're like me and you read a lot about food, uh, that perhaps you've never tried. So um, what's great for me is partly is I have to write the book, then I, you know, I try sesame and date molasses for the first time. And I knew about this combination, you know, but I've never tried it. So it's, I, I think that the book is fun for that reason. You just like go and tick them off. You know, mm -hmm. don't just read about them, go and actually try them and experience them because you never quite know until you try something like what your response is going to be. Um, but one that really sticks in my head is um, I think it was May uh, and it was all the very end of April. And it was my husband was away for work for quite a long time. And my I have twins and they were at nursery school and they're at nursery school quite a long, like a mile away from my house. And on a really rainy day, I had been reading about this Italian combination of fresh fava beans popped from the pods while they're still small and beautiful and like little children's fingernails and pecorino cheese. And I kept reading all these beautiful romantic accounts uh, and feeling really uh, just, oh, just so much like I wanted to be there that I wanted to be in this beautiful park in Rome popping fresh beans out of their pods, cutting off a piece of pecorino, maybe a nice dry white wine, you know, having this great May Day picnic, being very free. And that, you know, that afternoon I pushed the double buggy down the hill in the rain to the nursery school, but I stopped at the greengrocers and I picked out all the tiniest broad bean pods that I could find. And I, there's a fancy cheese shop. I bought myself a very you know, nice slice of pecorino, I went into a wine shop that was really fancy and said, what wine do you have that go with uh, raw broad beans? And the, obviously the wine, so it's like, I had no idea and thought I was completely crazy. Uh, some bread, and I picked up the kids, pushed them back up the hill in another, at, another mile of rain. And when they went to bed, I had this picnic that I'd been reading about all day, sitting in my kitchen on my own. And it was so transformative. I mean, it was just like, I. It was so romantic. It was so wonderful. And I remember it even now, how, what a strong atmosphere there was, that I had all this borrowed loveliness of this combination in my very kind of ordinary humdrum end of my day. 
And I think that is, you know, that is the importance of kind of understanding the, you know, the culture that comes with something because it can, it can, you know, can lend you a bit of the beauty. Well, on that very gorgeous note, and maybe the most evocative description of flavour that I've ever heard anyone give, I, I think maybe it's time for questions. Um, so I've got, Laura, is this right that there are questions in the Q&A box that people have submitted? Um, and I should just yes. read, read them out. Okay, great. Well, so we've got a question from... Kevin and Lisa Carhill. Um, as you explain the flavor wheel, does it work like a color wheel in that the foods on the opposite side of the wheel complement? Uh, no, I'm afraid not. As I, I think, if I could manage that, I would definitely be a, a millionaire. -ess. I um, no, it's a, it's a organizing principle for the books and it works. Um, one thing that you will find out is if you read the text, you will see that it's a, it's a spectrum of flavors. So mm -hmm. one runs into the next flavor, into the next flavor, into the next flavor. And that is, as a rule, that's on some kind of molecular basis. So they will have kind of flavor molecules in common. Great, a question from Sharon. Uh, how many times did you try each flavor combination during the writing process? It sounds like such an interesting task. And were there some awful combinations on the way? Um, well, some, I mean, some of the combinations once, because obviously if you're doing something like 800 combinations uh, and some of those things are gonna be actual recipes for the book and some of them are serving suggestions, you, you know, you only have so many time, you know, so much time in the day to try things. So, I think I have tried, I mean, obviously anything that's a recipe or a serving suggestion, then yes, I'll have tried it. But if it's just um, a mention of the combination, not always. I mean, there are certain things in there that I don't like or don't eat. And uh, particularly in the first book, um, there's something that I don't like, but I'm not going to say what it is. Uh, and um and there's in the first book, there are truffles and there's caviar. And I, you know, that my poor writer's advance does not kind of cover such <laughs> luxuries. But as a rule, yes, I do tend to try everything. And certainly with this book, where I wanted to kind of expand my horizons at the same time. So there were certain things where uh, I hadn't read about them, but I just had an instinct that they might go together. And so was kind of trying new things. There are definitely things that um, that you come across that don't go together. You know, I, I I remember making chocolate pecan butter like you would make a Nutella with hazelnuts or filberts, and that doesn't work at all. Um, you know, something like some a nut like hazelnut has this kind of some high notes that survive when you mix it with chocolate, whereas pecan kind of just gets very very swamped in that kind of in that kind of instance. I mean, that's what happens most of the time is that you end up kind of pairing ingredients and one just kills the other. It's just, mm -hmm. and then it's sort of not worth it. And I think one of the things we're trying to find in pairings is things that have a kind of mutual appreciation in them. Uh, I think my husband who tests, has to eat a lot of this stuff as I'm testing it, will probably say there were more failures than I can remember. <laughs> Brilliant. Laura, do you have other? I other have a question. Yeah. <laughs> I know that a lot of the people who um, tune into these talks feed families. And since you are feeding your twins, um, I wondered if, um, the, did this help you uncover any things that they particularly like or how, how did sort of using this book influence the way that your kids eat, if it did at all? <laughs> Um, yeah, I might not be acing that actually. <laughs> <laughs> no one is, let's be clear. <laughs> um, no, they, they seem to be very, very uh, set in their ways and they, they kind of say, oh, we're your guinea pigs, but they, um, yeah, they're not always that brilliant at trying new things, I'm afraid. I'm, try I'm trying to think, I, on the other hand, managed to get myself over things that I thought were boring. Uh, there are certainly lots of, you know, this is the, this book is plant led and there are lots of, I always thought that white beans like cannellini beans and haricot beans, very boring beans. If you're going to, you know, why have that when you could have bolotti or black beans, which have got a lot more flavor to them. And 
one of the things that was very interesting in writing the book was actually separating out um, brown and black beans from white beans, from broad uh, fava beans um, and from kidney beans and finding that they did have quite different characters and that they did have you know, preferences for certain types of flavor combinations. So uh, I got over not liking white beans. I got over not liking green beans because I found out that um, the problem with green beans is that uh, that whole idea of cooking things al dente was the reason that I didn't like them because green beans taste raw even when they're cooked, unless you really, really cook them for a while. Uh, and so I found out that actually I really like green beans when they've been slow cooked, but not when they're younger. So I think there's lots because there are so many combinations. There's lots of ways of trying things that you might have written off for, you know, for one reason or another, or because you've been cooking them in a different way. And there's lots of stuff to kind of uncover there and say uh, that, that possibly you do like something. You just haven't quite found it yet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I did have one more question about, I mean, the, your first book has been out for 10, 12 years now. Did you have, has anyone <laughs> told you about any like unusual ways that they've applied it? Like, do they mostly just use it in the kitchen or have people used it for like, I don't know, like class work or anything like that? Just like funny stories about unexpected uses of your first book. Um, I had to get a letter from someone that which I thought was really beautiful, which was uh, a man who lives in one of the kind of far flung Scottish islands. And he wrote me this really beautiful letter on note paper and sent to me in an envelope about how his wife had died recently. And he had to, uh, in his eighties was having to learn to cook um, for the first time in his life. And that he didn't really feel that cookbooks were any use to him because where he lived, the boat came twice a week with some groceries on it and you got what you got and you know you got what was on the boat and that he was using the book for that kind of, because it helped him kind of just navigate what you know what he had and what he could make and I just I mean that's just a lovely story and so you know and so sweet that someone bothers to kind of write and tell you that yeah. it's been useful to them yeah clearly very important to him yeah. And that's, I mean, I think that's one of the great things about your books is the, um, you know, like here's someone who hadn't really cooked much before, but it was still extremely usable for him, you know, and that's, and I think that's a difficult needle to thread, you know, of like an intuitive cook can pick it up and be like, oh yeah, apples, pecans, I'm, you know, go. And, but then yeah. someone who hasn't cooked much can pick it up and really learn from it and, and sort of it, one of those books that makes them a better cook. Yeah, I and mean, he was Thank obviously a kind of jump in kind of guy anyway, because it's not going to, I mean, the flavor of the source is not going to teach you to cook, I don't think. It's going to help you feel more confident and yeah. it might help you start to kind of like twist things your own way. But, um, and it, you know, obviously it has recipes in you could follow, but I, I guess he, he was, he was fairly, I mean, he was certainly not the kind of person that I was when I set out learning to cook where I needed someone to kind of tell me you know, whether it was half a teaspoon or a teaspoon of water, and I'd worry about, worry about which one. <laughs> totally. Totally. <laughs> Same. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, both of you. Cynthia, thank you so much again for, as Nikki said, taking time out of book writing and restaurant running and award winning and working your way through your fabulous Fortnum and Mason hamper <laughs> to uh, <laughs> to talk with us today. And Nikki, so congratulations on, oh, and Nikki, oh. congratulations on another wonderful book. And, um, and yeah, and good luck with yet another fantastic resource. Thank you very much. Um, Thanks for having us. No, we're delighted. And thank you everyone for tuning in today. Um, the talk will be up on um, YouTube very soon. And so um, happy flavor pairing and happy cooking, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.